Hello, my name is uh, Father James Heft, a Marianist priest, now at the University of Southern California after 29 very happy years at the University of Dayton. Uh, this Sunday, October 13th, 2019, John Henry Newman will be canonized a saint in the Catholic Church. I'm thrilled that this has come about because there are many, many people who have believed that Newman really wasn't a candidate for canonization, beginning with himself. Somehow that was brought up to him at one point or another. And he said in the process, he says, I have nothing of the saint about me, as everyone knows. And he says, he adds, it's a severe and salutary mortification to be thought next door to one, next door to a saint. And he went on, he says, I may have a high, few, a high view of many things, but it is the consequence of education and, he adds, a peculiar cast of intellect. But this is very different from being what I admire, a saint. I have no tendency to be a saint. It's a sad thing to say. Saints, he adds, are not literary men. They do not love the classics. They do not write tales and so on. So... He pretty well closed the door on that, uh, but as uh, often happens, he wrote once that truth is the daughter of time, and in time, uh, this has come about. So I just want to say a few things about him by way of introduction. If you want to get to know a good bit about Newman, I would recommend very highly this book by Ian Kerr. It was published in uh, 1988, so over 30 years ago. And it's 750 pages, and it's an excellent full overview, including commentary on his writings. If you want a simpler introduction, there's one here called Newman 101. And this came out in 2008, written by a friend of mine and an English theologian, Roderick Strange. It's a wonderful book, not that long at all, very accessible, 170 pages. It would be worth your time. And much more recently, from the same author, Roderick Strange, there is this book, Newman, The Heart of Holiness. And it's really on the occasion of his canonization. So it was published this year, 2019. I don't want to take much time. I could easily do that. So I just want to say a few things about Newman. Born in 1801, initially an evangelical, then he became an Anglican, and then in 1845, he became a Roman Catholic, died in 1890. A very long and very productive life, but not an easy one. In fact, it could be said that, especially once he got involved in, an, in the, what's called the Oxford Movement, which was in the 1830s, where he wanted to bring out a little bit more of the Catholicity of the Anglican Church, and eventually that ran into a lot of pushback. Um, he began to work hard on a book that he began as an Anglican but ended as a Roman Catholic. And it's called An Essay on the Development of Christian Doctrine. It's an extremely important book in the history of Christianity and Catholicism itself. Um, before that time, especially from the Oxford movement on, he wasn't trusted by the Anglicans because he sounded too Catholic. And then once he became a Catholic, he wasn't trusted by most of the Catholics because he didn't fit the mold of kind of manualistic textbook Catholic theology uh, based on Aquinas. He was a historian. He was a scholar of the first five, six centuries of the church. He had a profound sense of those early centuries where there were many church councils, where they're trying to figure out how to talk about Jesus and God and so on, and hammering it out with some different category. He knew an evolution. He could see an evolution. So the question was, could that evolution of doctrine, a deeper understanding over time, with some hiccups here and there, but gradually uh, getting it uh, less and less incorrect, um, could that have pointed the way to the Catholic Church as being the truest of the Christian churches? And he came to that conclusion uh, at the age of 44, made his confession, and was received into the Catholic Church. And that began a whole new chapter. 
and not an easy one for him. Um, some have claimed he's the greatest theologian since Thomas Aquinas. People that, you know, have, have big credentials in this field. Newman would never think of himself as the theologian. He would think of himself as a religious writer and actually also think of himself as um, a controversialist. He seemed to be in one controversy after another. And he wrote about the things that really he was passionate about and had to deal with. But I've been a long time admirer of Newman. In fact, in my office here, I have a portrait of Newman, which uh, hangs there to inspire me whenever I feel like I'm, I'm losing my way. He's, uh, he's really a wonderful person. Uh, it would be impossible to imagine Vatican II without Newman. His influence was deep upon a number of the major theologians at Vatican II, Henri de Lubac, Yves Congar, Karl Rahner, uh, even Hans Kuhn. These are people that all knew Newman and respected him a great deal. Uh, so we're at the Institute here uh, at uh, USC, the Institute for Advanced Catholic Studies, which I'm privileged to lead here. We're celebrating it uh, next week. We're also bringing in a Newman scholar um, on November the 12th to speak about Newman at the university. But in the meantime, what we have done is we've produced a whole series of bookmarks in honor of John Henry Newman. And we have some really good quotes from him that you probably um, have not encountered before. And by way of conclusion, I'd just like to read three of them to you that uh, you might find interesting. Here's one of them. As a Catholic believes that the church is, so to call it, a standing apostolic committee, to answer questions which the apostles are not here to answer concerning what they received and preached. As the church does not know more than the apostles knew, there are many questions which the church cannot answer. Or another one, the very idea of infallibility, and I could go on about his commentary on infallibility. It was a great, a great help to me in researching that doctrine on which I did my, my doctoral dissertation on the historical origins of papal infallibility. He says, the very idea of infallibility is negative. A pope is not inspired. He has no inherent gift of divine knowledge. But when he speaks ex cathedra, he may say little or much, but he is simply protected from saying what is untrue. And the third one, you may have heard this one before, but I love it. The heart is commonly reached, not through reason, but through the imagination, by means of direct impressions, by the testimony of facts and events, by history, by description. Persons influence us, voices melt us, looks subdue us, deeds inflame us. Many a man will live and die upon a dogma, no man will be a martyr for a conclusion. Let's celebrate his canonization. I hope it leads to many more people reading his great works. Thank you.